With more than a thousand deaths now attributed to coronavirus across the U.S., more than a third of which, by the way, are in New York, the top doctor in the coronavirus task force says every state needs to get ready for outbreaks like that. That's the course of these types of outbreaks. So we're having a situation as is predictable when you have outbreaks like this that you seed different areas from areas that are hot spots. To that end, Massachusetts Health and Human Service Secretary Mary Lou Sutter's announced today she's working with medical school deans to help fourth year students graduate a month early and get a provisional medical license. Already, more than 100 Boston Hospital employees have tested positive for the virus, with almost 50 cases each at MGH and Brigham and Women's alone. Governor Charlie Baker also announced today he's asking for a major disaster declaration from the federal government to bring more help to our state. The major disaster declaration would give support and flexibility to our communities as they respond to the COVID-19 outbreak, including disaster unemployment assistance and crisis counseling assistance to help support our residents. That request comes after almost 150,000 new people across the state filed for unemployment this week and 3.3 million nationally. That's more than four times the last record set in 1982. But as former Time Magazine managing editor Richard Stengel put it, if you ever needed an object lesson than why the stock market is not the economy, on the morning of historic levels of people filing for unemployment insurance, the market opens by going up hundreds of points. In fact, the Dow ended closing more than 1,300 points higher, thanks to investor optimism over that stimulus package. The House, as you know, is set to take it up tomorrow, with all signs pointing to a largely bipartisan approval. Now joined via Zoom by Massachusetts Congressman Seth Moulton, who's currently self-quarantining as he's been experiencing coronavirus-like symptoms. Congressman, I really appreciate your joining me, particularly under the circumstances. It's good to be back, Jim. How are you feeling? I'm feeling much better. Uh, my wife and I uh, were not feeling great last week. We had some of the classic symptoms of this virus, a tight chest, uh, difficulty uh, breathing, uh, you know, get, when getting winded, just walking up the stairs, uh, body aches, fatigue, uh, elevated, you know, body temperature, fever, um, you know, many of the classic symptoms that you hear people describe. But we've been very lucky that they've been relatively minor compared to what some people are experiencing. Of course, people are in the hospital for this, and we haven't had to seek any medical care ourselves. Uh, how about that little girl of yours, Emmy? What's with her? Well, Emmy is 18 months old and totally symptom-free. So, uh, you know, it's interesting that the way this is manifesting is exactly the way the statistics show. My symptoms are worse, are the worst. Uh, Liz's are better than mine. Women tend to fare better with this virus than men. And Emmy doesn't have any symptoms at all. As we know, statistically, it hardly affects children uh, at all. You know, you try, uh, people I assume know, you don't uh, take the congressional health plan. You continue to go to the VA. You attempted to get tested and failed. Why? Well, what they said is that they're only giving tests to the most uh, severely ill uh, patients because they just don't have enough to go around. For those of us who... Uh, are just going to stay at home for our treatment because we don't need to get a ventilator or something like that. It doesn't really matter whether we test positive or negative. The treatment protocol is the same. There is no treatment for this disease other than uh, just you know staying home and resting and you know making sure your own immune system can fight it off. So that's the rationale I was given. But given that we are confirmed symptomatic for this disease, I think it's a real problem that we can't get tested. We we know that there are people who are asymptomatic for COVID nineteen who are testing positive. So the fact that two people who are symptomatic can't get tests, it just points to the massive failure uh, with the testing across the country. Well, I'd say it's even worse than that. I mean, I, it sounds like th this is a four tour in Iraq kind of vet speaking when you're downplaying your symptoms. I read you say the tightness in your chest was like you had never felt before. If that doesn't rise to the level of being symptomatic to the point where you should be tested, uh, what does? Well, it's interesting because I've talked to a few different doctors over the course of the last few days. Uh, the first I talked to uh, was actually originally a Navy doc, then an ER um, doctor at Beth Israel, now, now down south. I mean, I didn't even get halfway through my symptoms, and he said, you need to go get tested immediately. Uh, but other doctors have said things that are different. Uh, I have a friend who's in graduate school at Harvard, 
Uh, he has many of the symptoms I do, but he does not have the tight chest. Uh, the Harvard doctors told him if you had tightness in your chest, you'd get tested immediately. Uh, but obviously that wasn't the case with the VA. So different hospitals and doctors are all over the place because there just aren't enough tests to go around. I don't want to belabor this point, but one final thing. If a vet with your stature in the United States can't get tested with those kind of symptoms, do you not worry about your fellow vets getting tested as well? I do. I do. In fact, a veteran who used to work uh, for me, uh, actually another current grad student at Harvard, uh, he went to the VA uh, to get tested. He actually did get a test, but he's been waiting eight days for the results. So this whole system is broken, and it's not just at the VA. Uh, across the nation, not enough people are getting tested. And I sent a letter to the vice president a month ago, Jim, a month ago, saying that we've got to get on top of this testing issue. It's the only way to stop the spread of the virus, to know who actually has it. A month later, we still don't have enough tests. So this is a massive failure on the part of the administration. I want to return to the VA in another context in a minute, Congressman. But are you able to vote remotely Tomorrow, I'm unclear. I mean, there are scores of Congress people who are not in Washington. You, for other reasons, obviously. Are you going to be able to vote on this package? No. No, the par- current plan is to pass by voice vote, uh, which means that we don't all have to be there. That, that's not the right way to do this, Jim. This is the largest stimulus package in American history. I've never voted on something that costs more money, and yet we won't even really get a vote. Uh, debate is being limited. Uh, This is because across the federal government, we are not prepared for this pandemic. And although the biggest failures are out of the administration, uh, with Trump downplaying this disease, literally making fun of it uh, uh, in the early in the early days, um, across the government, we're not prepared. And um, we need to be better prepared to think about the contingency plans for doing things like making sure Congress can still do its work when we have uh, issues like this in the future. I'm assuming you would vote yes if you were there. And if that assumption is right, despite that, because a lot of Democrats and Republicans said they're voting for it, even though it's imperfect. What does this $2 trillion bill not do that you think it should have? Well, it's not a perfect piece of legislation, but it's pretty darn good. And it's come a long way from the Senate Republican draft. You know, I laid out my, my four priorities. Number one, supporting hospital workers, nurses, and doctors on the front line who still do not have enough proper protective gear to do their jobs. That's like when they sent us into Iraq uh, without armored vehicles. Uh, We need to serve them first. The second thing we need to do is help everybody who's lost a job. Workers, American families, people at home who are trying to figure out how to get their kids lunch because they used to get it at school. Number three, small businesses. And small business support has to come before any large corporations. Only after you do those top three should we talk about any industry bailouts. Of course, the original uh, Republican draft had industry bailouts first, big corporate bailouts to the airlines and the the cruise ship industry, and they didn't have uh, anything uh, for hospital workers. So in many ways, the Republican draft had my priorities exactly reversed. So we've come a long way. Uh, But is there more we could do? Of course there's more we could do. I was on the phone with uh, Gloucester Fisherman this morning. We asked for support for uh, the fishing industry, which has been decimated uh, by this crisis. And we got some support, but not nearly as much as we had asked for. Well, this is the biggest stimulus bill everybody knows ever. Will there be another? There has to be. You know, the the economic estimates vary, but uh, most economists seem to think that the hit to our economy uh, of from this pandemic will be on the order of eight to 15 trillion dollars. So as big as this bill is at $2 trillion, I mean, truly historically big, it's only a fraction of the eventual economic cost, at least as it looks right now, from this pandemic. So we have more work to do. Two last things about the the package. We have a a reporter on a story I'm going to play in a couple of minutes, Liz Nieslaus, who talks about the troubles of both economic and health that undocumented people are suffering through in Boston. The president said emphatically the other day that undocumented people will get free testing. Is there anything in any legislation that has gone through Congress that guarantees that right, whether you care about undocumented people or you just care about them not harming other people? Is there anything that guarantees it? Uh, Look, the legislation has been very clear that everybody can get a test for free and undocumented Uh, immigrants need to know uh, that they will not be deported for going and getting a test. 
Uh, what we have not succeeded in getting yet, because we have not uh, gotten support from Senate Republicans, is to ensure that treatment is free. And that's got to be essential, too, because everybody in this country can spread the disease. It doesn't matter whether you have your immigration paper, papers or not, uh, you can spread the disease. It's so important that everybody get tested and everybody can get treated for free. That's got to be part of stopping this epidemic. So, uh, Seth Moulton, I try to ask only one naive question a week. So this is my allotment with all with you. 96 to zip in the Senate in most the, the most dysfunctionally partisan Congress in my lifetime. Does this signal a new era or is this just a single moment in time? Uh, I would love to be optimistic, but I'm afraid it's just a single moment in time. I think everybody realizes the urgency of getting this over the finish line so that we can get help to uh, American workers, American families, and especially those doctors and nurses on the front lines as soon as possible. Can we return to the Veterans Administration for a minute? Uh, the sure. three missions, as you know much better than I, serve vets through care, research, and training. I don't know if it's informal or not, but there's a fourth mission, basically to provide backup emergency help help to the civilian population when the tradition when there are emergencies as i said a minute ago the washington post reports that on friday of last week that so-called fourth mission was erased from the va's website what does that mean what, what are they saying to us what it fundamentally means is that this administration is uh is carefully admitting that they are not prepared for this pandemic because if they were prepared, uh, the VA would be fully engaged uh, and ready to help out. But let's be honest, Jim, we all know the stories of how the VA can't take care of veterans. The VA can't take care of veterans in this country, so how are they going to take care of additional people in this crisis? Let me also say this, though. Uh, the VA uh, administrators that I've talked to here in, in, in New England, including the head of the whole New England VA system, have been very much uh, on top of this and proactive and have offered their help uh, to Governor Baker. In fact, I connected uh, the head of the VA in New England to Governor Baker uh, because, frankly, they were a bit ahead of the, the state in terms of preparations. They had already designated certain wards and certain hospitals to take care of COVID-19 patients so that they were separate from other patients coming in. So the VA is doing the best job that they can on the ground. But the leadership in Washington is atrocious, and this is another failure of the administration to be prepared for this massive pandemic. Seth Moulton, you've taken a lot of heat from some of the people challenging you in a primary for a resolution you co-sponsored. The only Democrat, from what I understand, to co-sponsor a resolution condemning China for their behavior in the early stages of this coronavirus thing. One of your opponents said it was racist, xenophobic. Whether it is or not, uh, are you not concerned about some of the blowback that has happened to Asian Americans, including violence. And don't you think that kind of resolution contributes to that dangerous environment? Oh, of course I'm concerned about that. In fact, I've been speaking out against it for, for weeks. And I've been someone who's had extremely strong words about racism in America uh, to the point that it's, you know, upset a lot of people who think I'm being too strong. So, uh, of course, that's a concern. And, and look, Jim, my heard from a lot of Asian American friends and some colleagues who are concerned about this resolution. And so actually, I've decided to take my name off it. But I want to explain why it's important instance, even though uh, I, I recognize that it's hurt people because of, the, because of the way in which the administration has used it to play into the president's racist rhetoric. You know, I, I've always been a member of Congress who's focused on national security issues. And I signed on to the resolution because China is our biggest geostrategic threat. And I'm troubled by the Chinese Communist Party's disinformation campaign, which is literally blaming the U.S. military for the creation of COVID-19. And, and also the, all the other ways that the Chinese government has handled this crisis from downplaying the pandemic and kicking out American journalists to continuing to, to, to persecute the, the Uyghurs. So I think it's important to highlight the playbook that authoritarian governments like China use so that we can also call out President Trump for, make, for making use of some of the same tactics here at home. And you do think when he refers to it as the China virus, that is racist? Is that what you've concluded? It's totally inappropriate, yes. Um, and it fits into his whole xenophobic narrative, which is really just trying to deflect blame for the crisis here at home. 
uh, from, uh, you know, from uh, the job that his administration is frankly just completely failing to do. And so, look, when I heard uh, from people in the community who were really hurt by this resolution, I said, look, this is not the intent at all. The intent is to show some real bipartisan opposition to the Co Chinese Communist Party in the way that they are uh, prosecuting this massive disinformation campaign directed at our troops. And, and Jim, you know, I'm always going to stand up for our country and our troops. Uh, the problem is that the resolution has been taken sideways uh, by certain people in the Republican Party. Um, you know, not many of the uh, members of the Armed Services Committee, who I think uh, on both sides of the aisle recognize uh, the threat that China poses to the United States and the Chinese government's efforts um, to undermine what we're doing. Uh, but this is a resolution. If you read the text, it's all about the Chinese government. It's not about the Chinese uh, people. And of course, uh, we recognize that Asian Americans here at home need to be protected. So I'm glad to be off it because I know some people were hurt by it. Uh, and that was not at all the intent. Uh, I'm also grateful for the colleagues of uh, people like Representative Grace Meng, who reached out and, you know, talked to me about this, expressed some of their concerns, uh, uh, even despite the value of the substance of the resolution. And I'm a proud co-sponsor of her uh, resolution condemning the violence against Asian Americans that, that sadly is still going on today. Seth Moten, we have a minute and a half left. I'm going to ask you quickly to rate two leaders. We know in Massachusetts the school closings were extended by the governor yesterday. Non-essential businesses closed as of a couple of days ago. An advisory to stay at home. Yet f are the number of people who have lost their lives in this state because of the virus jumped from 15 to 25 in just one day. How would you rate the job that Governor Baker has done so far, Seth Moulton? Look, I'm not going to give him a grade. We all got to be on the same team here in fighting this virus. But I'll tell you that I've been in regular touch with him. Uh, I've been pushing him to do things like uh, designate hospitals um, for uh, COVID-19 patients so they don't infect people who are trying to come in to deliver a baby or deal with a broken arm. Um, close the schools. Uh, we pushed for that with our local school, school superintendents before the, the, the school, uh, before the state came out in, in favor of it. And also to just do uh, a statewide shutdown because that's what we need to do to stop the spread of the pandemic. Uh, He's, uh, you know, he's been a good partner in working with us, uh, with us on these issues. Uh, but I do think that we need to take even more aggressive action going forward. I was going to ask you about the president, but one, you've answered, and two, technology is failing us. Seth Moulton, feel better. Same to your wife. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Jim. Take care. You too.